Zelensky, our new nanny. What do we say? Be afraid. Be very afraid. Things couldn't be more painful, which no. means they couldn't be more delightful in oh, Adam's Family know. Values, one of four new movies we're going to be discussing this week on Siskel and Ebert. Also coming up, our new movies starring Harvey Keitel, Madonna, Danny Glover, and Matt Dillon. And we'll also take another look at the amazing success of the Mexican film Like Water for Chocolate, which came out of nowhere to become one of the top imported hits of all time. I'm Roger Ebert of the Chicago Sun-Times. And I'm Gene Siskel of the Chicago Tribune. Our first film is Adam's Family Values. And unlike the original film, they did open up the story a bit this time, getting the Adams kids to go to summer camp, and that's a lot of fun. But still, the bulk of the movie takes place inside the dark Adams house, it's as the same kind of jokes are told over and over again. All of the key players are back, and they welcome, at least most of them do, a new Adams baby. He has my father's eyes. Gomez, take those out of his mouth. A baby in the house. It's about time. Take it off. <laughs> Did you see that? The other main storyline, a gold-digging nanny played by Joan Cusack out to marry and then kill Uncle Fester and inherit his fabulous fortune. We went through all the books, all the usual baby names. Lucifer. Benito. Mao. And then we came to our senses. Something simple. Something a child could live with. Pubert. Pubert. I like it. It's filthy. <laughs> So far, so so, until the Adams kids go camping. They're an oasis of darkness amid golden camp life. Why are you dressed like that? Like what? Like you're going to a funeral. Why are you dressed like somebody died? Wait. That's cute, but then it's back to Uncle Fester, Christopher Lloyd, and the killer nanny. I'm a virgin. <gasps> you are. Yes. What's that? It... It's someone who's never experienced physical love. Oh, you mean with another person? I got tired of them after a while. Adam's Family Values looks great. They've spared no expense, and they've hired Stanley Kubrick's great production designer, Ken Adam, who also worked on the James Bond films. But director Barry Sonnenfeld, a former cinematographer, cares, I think, more about how his film looks than how its jokes play. We do get the same kind of riffs over and over, and I watch most of them in stony silence. It's not a bad film. I think it's just a safe one. A mixed review for me. A little bit of the mix for me, Gene, and I gave thumbs down to the original Adams Family yeah. picture, and I think that, uh, which is very rare with a sequel, that this one is better than the original. And I so you, are you recommending I'm it? I'm recommending it, first of all, because it has a lot of subplots. I mean, there's the new baby, and that... Yeah produces a lot of funny jokes. There's the relationship between Uncle Fester and this sexy nanny. And then there's the summer camp stuff, so that it's not just jokes involving uh, stuff around the house. Morticia and Gomez, all that oh. stuff. I, well, the stuff that I like, is, I'm just repeating it, is the yeah. summer camp, because I wanted them to go outdoors and mix it up with regular people. I think that's when they're so funny. I mean, I made the same... Well, that's what happens at summer camp, for example. So, and and that, then also you have this joke that the regular nanny comes in and she turns out not to be regular at all. The baby stuff, there was one good line, I think yeah, we just well. showed it, which was the stuff about he's got uh, grandpa's eyes or something, he has to give them back. Yeah, well, there were, a lot of, there were a lot of good lines uh, in this film. Mixed for me. Okay, next movie. And our next movie is one of those tender, warm-hearted slices of life out of Ireland. Another one named The Snapper. The Irish almost seem to specialize in movies about the quirks and peculiarities of strange and lovable eccentrics. This time, it's a comedy about a young woman who gets pregnant. She won't tell anyone who the father is, not even her dad, who is startled when he hears the news, but bears up fairly well. What do you think? I don't know. It's the best you can do. Well, what do you think? I don't know. I should get out, I suppose, or, or, or throw a wobbler or something, but, but what's the point? That's Tina Kelleher as the daughter there and Cole Meany as her dad. As we get to meet the family, we find it's large and disorganized, but very loving. Yeah. 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 
Right over that one. Oh, oh sorry, Sharon. It's a rally. Of course, only the best. Dad eventually accepts the fact that he's about to be a granddad and is touching the way he supports his daughter, who he loves and sympathizes with. Nowadays, the husbands are there with the wives, you know? I think that's much better. You know, because they're able to hold their hands and help them and encourage them and see their child being born. Sheridan, I... Now, this is only if you want. I wouldn't mind staying with you. There's a lot of stuff about the neighborhood in the movie. The neighbors, the daughters, girlfriends, and the father's drinking buddies down at the pub. Seven pounds, 12 ounces. Huh? Is that a turkey or a baby? It's a baby. That's a good-sized baby. Yeah, it is, but isn't it, huh? Small turkey, though. Of course, one of the things not being said there is that everybody wonders who the new baby's father is. And when we find out the answer to that question, it provides some of the funniest scenes in The Snapper. This isn't a film that agonizes and lays blame, but a movie that takes human nature in both its best and its not-so-noble aspects. It's interesting, I think, that The Snapper is based on a novel by Roddy Doyle, whose first novel about this same family was made into another wonderful Irish film, The Commitments. That one was directed by Alan Parker. This one is directed by Stephen Frears, who has the same kind of touch for friends and neighbors that he showed in his 1986 mm -hmm. film, My Beautiful Laundrette. Yeah, Stephen Frears came to America and made a Hero with Dustin Hoffman, a picture that didn't work. And now he's going back to his roots. And well, he came to America and made The Grifters, too, a picture that didn't that, work. So. But I, I'm talking about a big Hollywood production. Yeah, okay. I think it's very clear that after the failure of Hero, he went uh -huh. back and did this project because he wanted to be in touch with the kind of characters, the wonderful characters that are in there that are fresh, completely unpredictable, not channeled through any predictable storyline with a beginning and end. You could almost take out the mystery of who the father is. They could have almost not revealed it, mm -hmm. and it wouldn't have made any difference. But you know, I did love the scene where she meets with the father of the child, and yes. I'm not going to give anything away, but the way they talk to each, each other, and then the flashback indicating how it actually happened, is all, I think, part yeah. of the richness of the film. I, what I'm trying to say is that it is rich enough yeah. just on, on the character level alone and the, and the surprises in, in the quirkiness of the behavior of the people that the film works. It's so much fun to meet these people who are intelligent, right. who are com have a lot of common sense, who don't get buffaloed into following all of the ins and outs they're of a lot typical stronger Hollywood than, plot. They're, a lot, they're, they're written with more strength than Hollywood movie characters are. They are. They're stronger yeah. people. You're right. Coming up next, Madonna's latest the film. She plays an actress much like herself put through her paces in a raunchy film by a director played by Harvey Keitel. The movie is Dangerous Game. Is that what you want? Yeah. Is that is that what you want? Yeah. That's what I want. Get off the set. You're wonderful in the scene. Okay? Harvey Keitel directs Madonna in Dangerous Game, a movie about the making of a movie in which we are regularly taken behind the scenes as the film is rehearsed and as the actors have sex with each other away from the set. It's a risk-taking, foul-mouthed film from much of the same crew that gave us last year's controversial picture, Bad Lieutenant, but this movie, Dangerous Game, is mostly a failure, coming awfully close to cheap exploitation. Here we see two actors in the movie, within the movie, Madonna and James Russo, and predictably, he verbally abuses her early on before sexually abusing her in a later scene. This fight scene would work only if we believed in the characters, and I didn't. I just heard shouting. You're too boring to be stupid. You're dead. You're dead. Your insecurities paralyzed you. You're dead and you don't even know it. I know it. And here, more false anger as the day's shooting halts abruptly when Russo's character complains to director Harvey Keitel about Madonna's acting ability. Frank, she's wonderful in the scene. Oh, Frank, you don't cut a scene. She's I cut the scene. scene. She's wonderful in the scene. Yes. You don't cut a scene. Oh, I don't give a f Come on, on, Eddie. You do not Come cut on, a scene. Eddie. To try to get her to perform better, Keitel stands in off camera for Russo, and he throws more verbal abuse at Madonna's character, trying to get her to react. He calls her commercial, and that insult is supposed to make us think we're really inside movie making because, in reality, she's such a commercial singer. You think you're so smart. You get it all figured out. 
You blow my brains out, you burn the house down, you kill yourself. All life's misery solved in an hour's worth of effort. Bravo. I thought most of this film was overwrought baloney, with lots of cruelty popping up when writer Nicholas St. John and director Abel Ferrara couldn't think of anything substantial to do. Dangerous Game, by all reports, was a troubled production. I think you can see the trouble right on the screen. Anger alone does not equal the story. You know, I think with your little phrase there, overwrought baloney, you kind of summed up my feelings about this movie. I really thought it was a waste of time. Boy. It's kind of like marked down bargain basement Cassavetes in which everybody kind of lets everything hang out and you oh, find out God. all the emotions behind the scenes. But Cassavetes did it very well. And this movie is simply a mess. There is, we don't feel we're behind any and real, it, no. we always feel like we're in front of the scenes. You got Whether it. they're making the movie or not. It's junk and it's just cheap exploitation. When we come back, My Matt ears. Dillon and Danny Glover are home Homeless man in the Saint of Fort Washington. He nothing to you. What you button in for? My son. He what? He blacker than you, matter of fact. I hear, I hear voices. You know. I, I, it's nothing wrong with him. Voices. Yeah. Uh, what about Joan? She hear voices. Joan? They say Joan. They don't call us schizophrenic. They call us saint. Matt Dillon plays a homeless schizophrenic, and Danny Glover is his best friend and only advisor in the battle to survive in the streets. And that's a scene from The Saint of Fort Washington, a new film that shows the daily reality of homeless men in New York City and also explains why and how some of them are homeless and why they prefer to live on the streets rather than submit to the rules of public shelters. Moses come down that mountain. Doctors ask him, what he hear? He said, thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not commit adultery. They say, oh yeah, Moses, you hear that? Voices say that? Hey, they shoot him full of Thorazine, lock him up, throw away the key. Hey, if it wasn't for voices, we'd still be pagans. Not you. Still be sacrificing lamb and sheep, even human beings. We'd be a race of sacrifices. And maybe you ain't schizophrenic. Maybe you just... Same. Most of their income comes from washing car windows, and although I usually don't like it when I see those guys approaching me with their squeegees, this movie made me see them in a whole new light. A dime, Matthew! A dime! Well, it's no better than slave labor. I thought we fought the Civil War to escape these wages. Dylan is mentally ill, but he's also a good person, and the Glover character realizes that and begins to take a fatherly interest in this kid who nobody else really seems to care about. I can't do it. What do you mean you can't do it? That money ain't gonna jump up and bite you, boy. It made of inanimate matter. Something gets in the way. What gets in the way? Thoughts, voices, I don't know. Control me. Something always in the way, Matthew. No such thing as clear sailing. You just don't know how to navigate, that's all. The Saint of Fort Washington was directed by Tim Hunter, who made that wonderful movie, The River's Edge. It's best when it shows us the daily routines of these homeless men. I like those scenes more than some other material that shows life inside the city's homeless shelters, where a sadistic bully who is complete cliche shakes down the other overnight guests. That story was predictable, but the details and insights into survival on the streets were not predictable, and Dylan and Glover do a good job of making them more understandable. When you realize how easy it is to slip through the cracks and end up without a job or a home, you realize also that there, but for the grace of God, go we. Um, I liked it just in the way that you liked it. Uh, there's that element of predictability with the, uh, the, 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 thug. the, the thug, and yeah. then there's another couple that's brought in, mm -hmm. uh, and some of the, uh, the workers are, you know, there are a lot of people in the system who are trying to do a good job, mm -hmm. too, and I thought that... It, that I wish that the director, I like the picture, but I wish that the director had enough confidence just with observing these characters yeah. as they walk through and just as they slept and he learns how to tie his shoes together under his bed so that uh, they aren't stolen during the night. That kind of stuff, I think, is the most interesting element. There of the are film. a lot of real good books like Down and Out in Paris and London and this new book Travels with Elizabeth that talk about people who are on the road and homeless and this yeah. movie has some of the same insights yes. and I agree with you. It'd been more, if it had been more documentary yes. and less predictable good guy, bad guy yes. showdown, it would have been better, but it's still an interesting It's still film. worth seeing. Okay, coming up next, we'll try to account for the amazing and continuing success of one of the most popular foreign movies ever made. Why is Like Water for Chocolate still playing to big crowds after 39 weeks? 
If you were to list amazing box office success stories of 1993, of course, the first, the big news is that Jurassic Park replaced E.T. as the top grossing film of all time. However, another quite amazing milestone is that a little film from Mexico called Like Water for Chocolate, which mixes sex with food in a gentle romantic tragic comedy, that film became one of the best-selling foreign films of all time, grossing over $19 million in 39 weeks, and it's still playing in 23 cities nationwide. Why? Well, I went back to see it for a second time this week, and I found a mostly female audience laughing with it and drinking in its unabashedly romantic story of a young woman in 1910 Mexico, forced by her over-possessive mother to remain single and not marry the man she loves, and instead, take care of mom. Nunca, por generaciones, nadie en mi familia ha protestado ante esta costumbre. Y no va a ser una de mis hijas que lo haga. In an effort to channel her erotic feelings, the woman throws herself into her cooking, creating recipes that wind up generating sexual heat. Tal parecía que en un extraño fenómeno de alquimia, no solo la sangre de Tita, sino todo su ser, se había disuelto en la salsa de las rosas, en el cuerpo de las codornices, y en cada uno de los olores de la comida. So why so successful? Well, look at this wildly romantic concluding scene where the woman is reunited with the man of her dreams. Literally, sparks fly. That's a great scene. Director Alfonso Arau, working from his wife Laura Esquivel's novel, really shoots the moon visually with this film. There are lush nudity scenes mixed with humor, and yet each of the characters remains an adult. George Lucas once told me in an interview that you can divide the world's directors into those who like people and those who don't. I think that director Alfonso Arau really loves people and loves people being in love, most of all, <laughs> which is maybe why audiences love Like Water for Chocolate. That may be it. You know, every few years there's a movie like The Dolce Vita, uh, The Gods Must Be Crazy, Cinema Paradiso, yes. uh, this film, movies with subtitles that break through and suddenly start playing to big audiences yep. all over the country, and then people start saying, hey, did... Did you see that movie, yeah. Like Water we get for that Chocolate? On the yeah. a lot. They're almost surprised that they went to see a subtitled movie as if it's some kind of a mystery or something. And the mystery is no mystery at all. This movie really reaches people, I think, at a real deep romantic level Very and gives romantic. them feelings that they can feel good about. Uh, it was interesting to see, you know, full nudity in, in a woman's audience, and it was played with warmth and humor. I mean, you could feel it in the crowd. I think it's uh, a I'll tell you, Gene, I think women like nudity just as much as men, but what they don't like is the man's Violent. kind of smutty attitude or toward nudity. Or the violence connected here. Yes, because here what it is, it involves love, it involves yes. physicality, and it involves warmth. Yeah, it's a really good film. Okay, when we come back, one of the best but most overlooked performances in the short but gifted career of River Phoenix. On our video segment this week, I'd like to single out a film named Dogfight, directed by Nancy Savoca, which was made in 1991 and starred the late River Phoenix, it is a wonderful movie with one of the very best performances in Phoenix's career. And yet this movie seems almost invisible. It didn't do well at the box office and it was overlooked by almost all of the tributes that appeared after his death. The movie takes place in San Francisco in 1963 as a young Marine played by Phoenix goes out on his last night of shore leave before shipping out. He and his buddies decide to stage a dogfight, a party to which they will invite only unattractive girls. He chooses a plain young woman, played by Lily Taylor, but before the night is over, he realizes how cruel he was, and also that he likes that young woman, so he tries to set things right. Can I help you? Yeah, excuse me, D dinner for two. Do you have a reservation? Uh, yes, my secretary called in Gilmore. Not that that should matter, being that there's plenty of room, as I see. <laughs> yes, sir, there is, but I'm afraid that unless you have a jacket, I can't seat you. Well, I'm wearing a jacket. Lily Taylor is one of the best actresses we have right now, and River Phoenix is wonderful here as the naive but sincere kid who basically has a good heart. So if you want to see a side of Phoenix that wasn't shown in most of his movies, and certainly not in the coverage of his death, take a look at Dogfight. It's a special movie. And now let's take another look at the films we reviewed this week. One thumb up, one down for the ghoulish comedy Adam's Family Values, which I thought had a lot of laughs and style. I liked it better than the original film. Gene did too, but not enough to recommend it. Two thumbs up, however, for the rich human comedy of The Snapper, a warm-hearted Irish slice of life. Two thumbs down, though, for Abel Ferrara's Dangerous Game, which gets lost in a meandering, self-indulgent, boring screenplay. And two thumbs up for The Saint of Fort Washington. We liked its insight into the daily survival tactics of the homeless 
but we both thought its subplot about a vicious street kingpin was overdone and predictable. Next week, we'll be back with reviews of more big holiday movies, including A Perfect World, starring Clint Eastwood as a lawman on the trail of escaped convict Kevin Costner. Also, Mrs. Doubtfire, starring Robin Williams as an actor posing as a nanny in the home of his ex-wife, Sally Field. <laughs> First, here's a woman. I'm getting hot flashes. And a dangerous woman with Deborah Winger as a tormented, misunderstood soul who finds love with Gabriel Byrne. That's next week, and until then, the balcony is closed. Fashion Bug for the latest in junior, misses, plus, even girls and men's fashions. 1,200 stores coast to coast. Fashion Bug fits your life. Ladies for close, smooth shaves in or out of the shower. The Lady Remington Wet Dry, rechargeable or battery operated. Lady Remington Wet Dry. Vicks Vapor Inhaler for fast, effective relief of nasal congestion. Easy to carry and easy to use anytime, anywhere. Take a breather with the Vicks Vapor Inhaler. St. Ives Swiss Formula Collagen Elastin Lotion. Made to work in the harsh Swiss Alps. St. Ives Swiss Formula relieves dry skin instantly, naturally. Thank you.